All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Peter Michael Bauer. I'm the founder and executive director of Rewild Portland. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, even if you um, don't know what Rewild Portland is or what rewilding is, thank you for coming. Um, after my little talk, hopefully you'll have a little bit more of an idea. Um, I want to thank all the volunteers, donors, and sponsors who participated and helped make this event happen. Um, if you're a volunteer with Rewild, please raise your hand. Everybody look around and see a lot of the folks here are Rewild Portland volunteers. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, Rewild Portland is mostly a volunteer-run organization, so it's all of us that make this happen. Um, Tonight we are at the Multnomah Arts Center, which is, uh, the word Multnomah is a Chinookan word. It's for a group of Chinookan peoples whose land this is. The word is actually pronounced uh, Masnumah in their language, and it basically means we're, uh, the people by the water, and it was a village um, on Savi's Island. And they're still here. They have the Confederated Tribes Grand Ronde and some Warm Springs and Chinook Nation. Um, so I just want to send out my thanks to them for uh, showing us how to live here on this, in this place in a sustainable way um, for people who are not native to this place. Yeah. Thanks. Woo. Um, so tonight is uh, rewilding, finding hope through resilience. And it's what rewilding means to the people here at Rewild Portland and how we go about rewilding. Um, this is a reflection of the larger community of rewilders, and I'm just a member of that. I'm kind of acting as a spokesperson tonight. I didn't necessarily write all of this or feel like it's mine to say that I own or, or sell, so I have by Rewild Portland on here because it's a collective process. I'm just the talking head tonight. Um, so tonight's roadmap, where we're going to go in this little talk. Um, First, we'll talk about what rewilding means and then uh, some of the crises that we're facing in the world today because of uh, the opposite of rewilding. And then we'll go into how rewilding can change those things. And then we'll go and talk a little bit about um, what Rewild Portland is doing. Um, so yeah, that's our roadmap for tonight. Um, if there's one thing that you take away from here tonight, uh, I would like it to be that rewilding first and foremost means living in a life, living a life in service to the land and ecological community of your place. Um, everything else, all the other benefits, those are a result of rewilding. So we'll talk about some of those later on. Um, but first, we'll talk about what rewilding is. Uh, this is the definition that's sort of floating around uh, the whatever, the zeitgeist of rewilding, the culture of, of rewilding. Uh, it's to return to a more wild or self-willed state, the process of undoing domestication. Um, synonyms are uncivilize and undomesticate. So what does that really mean? <sighs> uh, this definition appears a little bit too simplistic for me because rewilding is actually a fairly radical idea when you get into what it really means to undomesticate something. Because our whole culture for the last 10,000 years has been controlling nature, domesticating the planet. And so if we want to undo those things or if we connect those to the crises that we're experiencing today, then what we're talking about is completely creating a new culture altogether, um, which can be very radical because that can also imply going against the current culture which doesn't want other people to leave it and create other things. So um, it can be considered very radical uh, for that reason. But uh, let's talk about the definition of domestication. Um, the Webster's Online Dictionary, if you read it on the internet, it's true. So I got this from the Webster's Online Dictionary. To domesticate means to breed or train an animal or plant to need and accept the care of human beings. Um, so in the definition there, it talks about the need of care. So what it's doing is creating dependency. Domestication is a way of um, creating a, a dependency for an animal so that it no longer can exist in the wild. Um, and rewilding is the opposite of that. So this picture here is funny. This is a, a kind of a famous painting of a, a wild auroch 
and it's the, um, the hereditary ancestor of the domesticated cow. And I like the picture here between the two because you can kind of see one is having to fend off wolves and the other one's just kind of like. <laughs> and part of that is that, you know, what, what we gave up when we began to control the animals, uh, you know, to protect them in a sense, but at the same time, what do we lose when we try to control or protect ourselves from all of the elements of nature? And that's really what rewilding is about, is uncovering all the things that we lost and then reclaiming them. So now I want to talk a little bit about the major crises facing the planet. We'll go through them very quickly because um, I don't like to dwell on things that make me feel sad. Climate change. Everybody knows about climate change these days. Mass extinctions. Not as many people are familiar with this, but we're living in the sixth largest mass extinction in the entire uh, geological record, known record. Oh, that picture there, that's a, that's a pile of buffalo skulls, well, American bison skulls in the 1800s. Social injustice, that's just kind of as a thing that we have as humans, but also when you have a civilization, lots of people cramped in one little spot. Sedentary lives, they, uh, they tend to do crazy things like have hierarchies and um, base their cultures on slavery. So this is a picture from a Roman, it's an etching of a, a Roman slave. Of course, uh, this picture doesn't quite match this um, photograph, but I liked it because this is the tar sands. Just makes me think of like how I feel on the inside. <laughs> um, the degradation of health since the begin since 10,000 years ago. You know, we have a rise in mental health and physical illness and all things, all kinds of things like that. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a little bit, but that's one of the major things facing us, um, as well as obviously the health of the ecosystem there. Um, emergency preparedness, I threw this on the list because a resilient culture is one that can bounce back from environmental disasters, and uh, we don't, we're not very, a very resilient culture. Um, if there was an earthquake right now, it would be very, very bad. Uh, we have about three days' worth of food in the grocery store, and that would be gone in three days. So um, no, we need to work on that. <laughs> um, so a lot of these problems have their root in the Neolithic period. Um, and some people say that you need to study history so that you don't make the same mistakes. But I say you need to study prehistory pre so we don't make the same mistakes. Um, and what is prehistory? So when people began to write things down uh, about 5,000 years ago, they assumed that humans had been born relatively recently. Um, and it was only, so that was the beginning of history, was the beginning when people started to write things down. It was the beginning of humans. Um, only recently, with archaeology uh, and carbon dating and all kinds of things like that, we've been able to realize that humans have actually been on the planet for a very long time. Um, and when they discovered that, instead of extending the beginning of the human story to the beginning of humans, they created this term prehistory. And uh, one of my favorite authors, Daniel Quinn, in one of his books has a funny thing where he says, you know what prehistory is? Prehistory is the stuff that fish lived in before there was water. Sorry, <laughs> I messed that up. <laughs> he says prehistory is a lot like pre-water. You know what pre-water is? Oh, pre-water is the stuff that fish swam in before there was water. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, <laughs> sorry, I messed that joke up, but. <laughs> uh, so even, you know, it's funny that we made up this term as a culture because it's like, oh, you know, history is when we started to do stuff that's interesting. Prehistory is like, you know, we were playing with sticks and stones. Who knows what we were doing then? Um, of course, well, so let's look at human history really quick here, with, or prehistory rather. So this is a crazy, complicated graph I made that you are not expected to uh, look at. But this is a, a lineage of human evolution here. And uh, you can see we started walking on two feet as the, uh, the darker green is Australopithecus, And then the lighter green is Homo sapien, or sorry, the Homo genus. Um, let's simplify that a little bit. Nice, feels better, doesn't it? So the light green is modern humans, or not super modern, but 
the, the, the genus for humans. You can see uh, we started using stone tools at two and a half million years ago. Of course, they actually just found evidence saying that uh, they found a six million year old stone tool site, which means that the ostrapiths were probably using stone tools, which is pretty incredible. Um, that just came out like last week. So for two and a half million years, humans in our modern uh, genus have been here. Let's take a look at, uh, if I go back, you can see this last dot here, that's uh, about 200,000 years, that's us. That's Homo sapiens at the bottom there. And uh, let's look at just the Homo sapien era. So that whole green bar across the top there, that's Homo sapiens for 200,000 years. And this little red dot here, that's history. Um, so what were people doing before that time? That's what rewilding is trying to uncover because humans have lived here sustainably for three million years. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. But in this brief, brief moment of history, all of a sudden we're at the brink of ecological collapse. So what happened there? What did we do that was different? Um, this new thing called agriculture happened uh, in a lot of different places around the world. It uh, started happening, but in one particular place, the Fertile Crescent, it stuck around a lot more. There's cultures all over the world that have practiced various forms of agriculture, but for whatever reason, uh, in the Fertile Crescent, it stuck around, moved up into Europe. Um, I believe it was Jared Diamond who wrote an essay called uh, Agriculture, the Greatest Mistake in Human History, or something along those lines. Um, and I wouldn't disagree. Let's go through some of the highlights. So if your culture is built on farming as a sole subsistence strategy, that means that you have to have fields. And fields mean you have to cut down forests. So right away, we've got deforestation, which is a loss of biological diversity. Agra actually means field. Culture is short for cultivation. So agriculture is field culture. So soil erosion is another highlight of agriculture. Um, if you continuously till a, one particular place, eventually it washes away because you're not building soil. You're not moving through the phases of ecological succession, which is important for keeping soil in place and building it. So basically tilling the soil is an artificial catastrophe that keeps a, the forest succession at its minimal or primary state. So this is actually a picture from the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, I believe, and it's the cover of the book, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. <laughs> a great book on the topic. So uh, another thing, uh, another highlight of agriculture is the decreased lifespan and diminished health. Um, archaeological records show that tooth decay, bone density, heart disease, diabetes, uh, all kinds of things became problems with the advent of agriculture. Another thing, uh, possibly because of the lack of nutrients. When you switch to an agricultural diet, you're eating mostly sugary foods, um, and your, the diversity of the food that you're eating gets greatly diminished because you're focusing just on growing these particular things. Um, the decreased lifespan thing is interesting too because most people have this concept that hunter-gatherers died at the age of 35, um, but it was actually early agriculturalists whose lifespan shortened from the average median uh, or average age of humans, which is 65 years old. Um, some people lived older, some people died younger, but 65 seems to be sort of the sweet spot of uh, an average lifespan, that is if you live beyond the age of two. Um, but only recently has our lifespan increased in first world countries with modern medicine and all kinds of things. Um, another problem with agriculture was the human population growth explosion. Um, I notice here on this I've crossed out human there because this isn't the human story, this isn't humanity's story. This is the story of one culture in the Fertile Crescent that exploded out and sort of colonized the world. This is not the population growth chart for different indigenous cultures around the world. This would not be considered part of their story. So I didn't feel like human population growth on this graph was an appropriate word to use. And the last but not least, empire. This is, a <laughs> I was hoping people would laugh at this photograph. It's a reenactment of the Roman Legion. Um, when people live in sedentary cultures and their population increases, a social hierarchy forms. Um, it's just something that, that just occurs. It's almost natural in a sense. Um, perhaps we're not 
it's not ideal for us to live in that situation unless you don't mind living in that situation. Um, so in my definition, civilization, it's a natural catastrophe created when human culture practices full-time agriculture, causing their population to spiral into a positive feedback loop of growth, social hierarchy, soil depletion that leads to an inevitable collapse of ecosystems, biological diversity, and culture. Which is why now we're living in the Anthropocene era, and the Anthropocene extinction, which geologists are now calling this mass extinction, the Anthropocene, because it's entirely human caused. So now that I've completely depressed everybody here, um, and I can feel myself, my heart, own heart sinking, I knew this would happen, and to prepare for it, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of memes and lolcats. They make me laugh. And we have quite a few rewilding lolcats that we make and send to each other, so these are some of the highlights of those. Um, this is the invisible bow and arrow cat. <laughs> Cattail harvesting, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> In case you don't know, cattails are uh, great for basket weaving. So the, the plant, cattail, not the, not the animal. So that's a joke on that. This is a play on the, uh, the meat is murder vegan thing, but wheat is, is a, it's a joke, you know, agriculture. Um, this invisible bow drill. If you don't know what a bow drill is, it's a method for uh, fire by friction. And then you still making lolcats? That's not rewilding. <laughs> that was made by Willem right here. So. <laughs> During one of our lolcat wars. And last but not least, uh, runs ancestral skills school, spends all day on it. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we're all feeling happy again, let's talk about rewilding and how it helps everybody. So the good news in all this is that Humanity is actually uh, fit for this planet. We, did, we lived here for three million years, or longer, depending on how you define humanity. Um, and, it, and if you, you know, the last 200,000 as ourselves, same brains, same bodies, um, and we didn't destroy the planet. Uh, of course, we probably made some mistakes along the way. There's still some debate over the megafauna extinctions that happened. Um, but when settlers from Europe got here, the continent was thriving. It wasn't um, in a state of collapse like the one over there. And the people here, some people were practicing agriculture, but others weren't. The majority of people probably weren't. Um, they were probably practicing horticulture and immediate return hunter-gatherer, which is two life ways that are related to rewilding. So humanity is not flawed, and all we have to do to figure out what to do is look at those three million years instead of pretending that it's not really part of the interesting thing of humanity. We have to look at that. What were people doing? How did they interact with the land in a way that prevented them from destroying it? Um, and that to me is why rewilding offers a hopeful return because it says we're built to live here. We've been here for a long time. We just need to think about what we're doing. So looking back at the definition of rewilding, uh, to return to a more wild or self-willed state, the process of undoing domestication. Again, I said earlier, if there's one thing you take away from this tonight, I want it to be this, that rewilding first and foremost means living a life in service to the land and ecological community. All the benefits are a secondary to that. Um, you might be wondering why I have a blue jay with an acorn in his mouth as a picture for this, other than the fact that it's just a cool bird. Um, and that is that jays fly around and they cache acorns in the ground, but they don't come back and get all those acorns. So those acorns grow up and turn into oak savanna that the future generations of those jays will eat from. They'll be eating the acorns in 50 years when that acorn, if he doesn't eat that one in particular, grows up, it'll be the generations that were the future generations of this bird here. Um, and that kind of plays into this idea that all animals fit into their ecosystem in some way or another. Whether it was intentional that the jays are planting these seeds knowing that it's going to serve a future generation of jays or whether they don't know that doesn't really matter because in the scheme of evolution, 
this is what works for jays, and it works for oak trees, and there's a symbiotic relationship happening there. And all animals have that with multiple different things that they consume in order to live. And humans have that too, and hunter-gatherers and horticulturalists have that too. And that's what our ancestors were doing before they started to try to control nature through um, agriculture. So I have this picture here of the plank house because I wanted to relate this back to, um, this is the Kathlipotal plank house, which is actually pronounced Kathlipuch, which is a Chinookan village on the other side of the Columbia River here. Um, and to me, this was a, an example of how that relationship existed prior to colonization of this area and prior to colonization of everywhere else that civilization um, dominated as it, as it went across the planet. Cedar planks were harvested from timber here that were thousands of years old because the people here grew trees that were thousands of years old. They didn't clear cut them. Um, that picture that I had of the Anthropocene extinction were 30 people standing on a cedar stump. That's how big the cedar trees were here. And that was forestry practices by the people who lived here. It wasn't just uh, untamed wild nature in that sense. It was wild, but that was because just as wild as that blue jay planting that acorn. They could take planks out of the living trees and uh, keep the trees alive because the way that cedar comes out of the tree. So rewilding is about biological resilience. It's about those creating those connections, that interwoven web. And that to me is just a, an, a great example of that. While we're on the topic here of uh, natives, it's also important to give our thanks to the people who lived here before who have this relationship and still have it today and are able to share that knowledge with us in a respectful way. Um, so it's very important for me and for other rewilders to make sure that we're not being disrespectful when we learn this knowledge from Native people because obviously they've been through um, a cultural genocide. So I don't want to get too much into that, but we need to be very respectful of them and make sure that we don't step on their toes. Um, so if we stop cutting down forests to produce fields for soybeans in the Amazon now or other places around the world like that, um, we will be replanting them. Um, and this is an interesting picture here. I chose it because it's a classic example of replanting uh, trees. We've, I don't know if anybody here has done this. I did this in the Boy Scouts. We went out and it was considered a community service to replant um, trees after they had been clear cut. However, uh, a lot of those times, what they're doing is planting a monoculture of Douglas fir and not letting a biodiverse forest grow back. Um, so that's a, it's basically just farming with trees. It's, it's not quite the forest, it's just trees. Um, it's not the biological diversity that was once there. But obviously, um, climate change and the ecological extinctions that we talked about were both the results of deforestation. So if we can sink carbon back into the soil and back into trees and reforest the planet, we're gonna be solving those other, those other problems that we have. Um, so this is a funny picture, I chose it because I, uh, I wanted to also state that we have to protect the wild spaces that still exist today. So Rewild Portland is mostly based on community development and education um, and protecting things within the realm of the system. We work within the system, which is an avenue, but I also want to acknowledge the people who are on the, the fringe protecting spaces without permission. Um, and those that are doing it with permission. But we need everything. We need to protect our wild spaces and to protect indigenous lands as well. Um, um, so this is an interesting picture. <laughs> this is a, an attempt to rewild a cow. This is a, a project that's going on in Germany where they're, they're breeding a, a cattle trying to get it back to the Auroc because the Aurochs are extinct. All that's left of the Aurochs are now the domesticated cows. So there's these projects all around the world where they're reversing the domestication process of uh, these species that we've domesticated, which is important to me because I think um, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, well, if everybody went, you know, started rewilding, wouldn't, wouldn't we just go out and kill all, hunt all the deer and then there wouldn't be any deer? Well, that's, rewilding is about, first and foremost, living a life in service to the ecological community. So you wouldn't go do that. What we need to do is rewild everything else that's been domesticated as well. 
Um, and it's a process. It's not like you're going to be able to jump to a different way of life immediately. Um, but I just thought this was beautiful, that people are working on uh, rewilding animals like this. Um, so rewilding promotes cultural resilience, because cultural resilience relies on biological resilience. Um, the more biologically diverse a community is, the more uh, in touch with your land base you are, the more resilient your culture is going to be. If a traumatic event happens, you can withstand it a lot easier if you are not shipping your food in from 3,000 miles away, for example. Um, this is again, the, uh, cultural resilience through localization. So this is, a, this is a great photo. These are dandelion fritters that we made at one of our free skill series a couple years ago. And um, the idea of localizing all of our resources is, is the basis of resilience, really, is, is having everything right here available for us to use and in a way that's regenerative so that we don't destroy it as we take things. Um, cultural resilience requires understanding the ecological community around you. So it's not just practices, but we also need to understand ecology. So these are some raccoon tracks. That's our mascot, so I put those in here because the more you know about your place, the more resilient you'll be. Um, this is my twin brother. He's sitting over there. He's uh, <laughs> cultural resilience also relies on uh, being able to make things and do things. And so I chose this picture. That's Johnny. He's setting a fire going with um, some cedar bark tinder there. If we have the ability to make things with our hands, as the next slide also. Oh no, that was not. Uh, again, we're more resilient. So it's just this increasing this richness of resilience by getting the things that we need and being connected with the land. Um, so the side effects, I consider the health benefits of rewilding more or less side effects of rewilding as opposed to the main thing that you do because they don't attack, they don't go after the root causes of these problems that we're talking about. Again, if rewilding is about living a life in service of the ecological community, then that's attacking the root cause of things. If I'm just going out in nature because it feels good, that's awesome because it's true, but also it's not attacking the root causes that are domesticating us to begin with. So I don't consider it rewilding unless it's a, a package or part of rewilding. Um, but getting out in nature, if you didn't know, is actually really good for you. They find out it's science. Um, <laughs> uh, We'll go to the next slide. <laughs> Same thing, working with your hands has known to um, relax people, put you in a meditative state. It's really good for brain function, helps people with Alzheimer's and memory and all kinds of things like that as they're aging. Um, and this is a picture of one of our friends weaving an English ivy basket at one of our ivy basket classes. Um, uh, so I've got some little some berries here. One of the things about rewilding is when you localize your uh, food sources, you're, you get back to whole foods, and you start um, being having a deeper connection with those foods, and they're not being shipped, which means they don't have to have preservatives, which means they're theoretically organic if you're working with them closely. Um, and so it actually is also good for your health. The more local you get, the more resilient you get, the more it feels good in your body. Um, so how do we do all of these things here at Rewild Portland? Um, let me, let me turn to my notes here. I'm just kind of ranting without looking at these. They're blank. <laughs> so the mission of Rewild Portland is to create cultural and environmental resilience through the teaching of earth-based arts, traditions, and technologies. Ooh, yeah. Uh, what do we do? Education, community building, and ecological restoration. To all three of those things together build resilience. Um, and let's go through those. Oh, this is a, these are a bunch of ivy baskets here next to some ivy. That's out of the archery range. So with education, we focus on three elements, culture, food, and crafts. So with food, well, I'll start with culture since the top. Culture are cultural elements. They're invisible technologies or soft technologies, things like uh, nature-based therapy, mentoring children and adults. Um, how to do a ritual together as a community, what that means. All the things that are 
that are not tangible that can be made with hands. So that has to do mostly with interacting with people um, and how we, how we can come together. Food, whenever we do a food, which is usually wild edibles, we talk about the restoration principles behind those food products or those food, the plants. Um, there's a really great book out now called uh, Foraging, Pacific Northwest Foraging by Doug Doyer. And in it, he outlines, it's sort of a new idea in foraging that you can actually give back to the things that you're taking instead of just taking them from the wild, which we're so used to doing. Um, and every section, every plant section in his book, he has a future harvests paragraph that talks about how to propagate the plant that you're taking. And he got that from Northwest Coast natives that he studies with because those are their principles, because they have this regenerative system in place. This is why I'm saying we're learning from them. We should be respectful of them, try to get them their lands back, etc. With crafts, it's the same kind of thing. Um, there's a regenerative process. If anytime you take anything out of the natural world, you're leaving a hole. So how do you fill that hole? How do you create a regenerative relationship? Um, and one of the main ways that we do that is through using invasive species. So as you can see there, there's, again, some English ivy baskets. It's kind of the flagship of Rewild Portland is English ivy baskets. Um, it should be our mascot, but the raccoon is cooler, I guess. <laughs> um, um, and that's because when we extract the English ivy, which is very prolific here, it's considered an invasive species, we're restoring habitat for native species. And at the same time, then we're able to do something with that that keeps our traditions alive, um, like weaving. So these programs come in various forms. Um, we have a free skill series that happens on the last Saturday of every month. Uh, the themes change month to month. It cycles from the cultural skill, uh, craft, and a food. Each month is a different theme. These are two friends up at the Archer Range. Actually, this is cool. I want to get a photo of them now because uh, Aaron's child is actually like four now, and is, I saw a picture of the other day where he was shooting at the archery range with his own bow, and Matt has a baby, and he wears it around in a backpack, so I thought it'd be funny to get those guys and do another photo sequence where they're, you know, Matt has a baby and the other child's growing, but anyway, this is, uh, we did an archery skill share. Some of the things that we do, just examples, mentoring, natural quarters, that's stinging metal, acorn processing. A lot of the things that we try to teach are cross-cultural. So nettle is something that's been used all over the Northern Hemisphere as well as acorns. Um, acorn processing as a food source was something done anywhere where an oak tree was growing. So we try to bridge culture and community by bringing together things that more people around the world share in their ancestry. At the same time, if we offer a program that's native to this region, we'll have a native person teach it. Uh, upcoming is uh, Basket Weaving with Stephanie Wood, who's a Grand Ronde member, and Pat Courtney Gold, who is with um, Warm Springs. We have adult workshops. Uh, this is, again, another Ivy. We don't just do English Ivy, if you think that, <laughs> from these pictures. I just do it a lot, so it's my favorite thing. Um, these are some examples, basket weaving, felting, fire making, archery, bows and arrows. Um, we do youth programs, and in our youth programs, we don't talk about doom and gloom, obviously. Why would you talk about that? We just have adventures with the kids. Um, and part of that is about connecting them in an emotional way with the place that they're from and teaching them the regenerative aspects of human culture. So much of the education these days is about um, conservation where we're not allowed to touch nature anymore. And you go to these museums and you see cool artifacts that our ancestors made all over the world, but you never get to touch them or be part of them. Um, and I think it's important for people to realize that humans make an impact on the planet. What we, what we need to do is not, not make an impact. We need our impact to be, to be regenerative. So what we're trying to do is teach that to kids by just making cool stuff. And these are our themes of our camp, our uh, nature-based themes. So we have sand and mud, where obviously they get really muddy. Uh, sticks and stones, where we build stick shelters and uh, make rock knives and digging sticks and stuff. And then we have a skin and bones camp where we make bone tools and leather bags. And, um, and then a flint and steel camp where we, it's our only steel age or iron age camp um, where we teach kids how to make a fire. So with our community, obviously we're a nonprofit. So we're not out here to make a profit. We're out here to form a community. 
The reason I started this organization was because I wanted more friends doing this. I wanted to create a cultural impact doing this. I don't care about making money. Um, although we need money to keep going, so please uh, donate to us tonight. <laughs> uh, but we're not a for-profit, so obviously. Um, uh, our Skillshare is sort of the, it started out as the only thing that we did, and we keep growing and growing and building more and more people. This is uh, Frodo, she's a professor at PSU. Um, she teaches uh, women's spirituality, and she taught our ritual Skillshare for the last two years. Um, I'm really sad she can't be here tonight. She's actually out of the state. Um, but mad props to Frodo. Woo. Woo. Um, one of the ways that we're increasing um, interaction with Rewild is to start this membership campaign where um, you can help support Rewild by donating yearly to become a member. We go on monthly adventures. Sometimes they're foraging trips. Um, sometimes they're just hikes. Sometimes we go out and collect spring water or just nice things. Um, they're Sometimes they're family friendly, sometimes they're geared towards adults only. Um, members get discounts on our classes. Uh, they get the copy of the Raccoon Observer, which if you haven't checked it out yet, it's back at our membership table back there. It's a yearly, we send it out twice a year. It's a newsletter, it's got all kinds of cool stuff like wild food recipes and uh, philosophy of rewilding and poetry and photographs and illustrations. If you want to contribute something, go back there and talk to those guys and they'll know what's up. Um, and then we just started building a Rewilders library. I have this amazing library at home, and I don't want to share it with anybody. So <laughs> my, the board member said, okay, if you're not gonna share that, you gotta start a, a Rewild members library. So um, we started that, and that is going to be accessible when we open up our new space, which is uh, an art studio that we're remodeling in Northwest Portland. And it's a very small little space, but we'll have it theoretically in June, and that'll be where the Re Rewilders library lives. Um, it'll also have uh, tools, the Rewilders tool library for odds and ends of things like hide tanning and bow making and random tools that you won't find at a regular uh, tool library. So underlying all of our stuff, all of our programs is restoration and regenerative harvest. Uh, this is our stinging nettle skill share where we teach people how to eat nettles. Um, unfortunately, Portland Parks informed us when we started to partner with them that the admiral butterfly populations are on massive decline in the Portland area because of over harvesting of stinging nettle from urban foragers because it's so hot right now. Um, <laughs> but what they don't know is that they're killing butterflies and who can live with themselves to do that? Um, so, so instead of harvesting from the park, we went outside of city limits, harvested nettles, brought them to the park, taught the class there, and then gave out nettle sprouts for people to plant in their yards around Portland. That's sort of the principle that we're talking about here is how to give back to the things that we're taking. And that's just one example. So these are all the things that we're doing to build resilience here at Rewild Portland. Um, and I'm almost done. So <laughs> this is a plot of dandelions in an ID basket. So there's a few barriers to rewilding how to make rewilding more available to people of all kinds, how to make rewilding more legal, um, and how to power down or make the transition to rewilding from where we're at now. Um, and what we need is a cultural momentum. And so that's what we're here to do, is to build this cultural momentum by educating people in all these different things and um, in sort of the true meaning or the, the deeper meanings of resilience and how humans have that intrinsic in us, we just have to figure it out again. And we can do that by looking back at our ancestry. So Rewilding is a small grassroots organization, nonprofit. It's run by a staff of volunteers and a one quarter time staff person who works two other jobs. That's me. Um, we don't have an office or a classroom or outdoor location of our own, although we're trying to get the, the classroom. Um, if you value our mission and think we are providing an important service to our community, and uh, then we need your help to grow it and become sustainable. Um, raising more money would enable us to secure funding for scholarships, which is something people ask us a lot about and we wanna be able to provide. Um, we wanna be able to make these skills accessible to everyone. 
So I just want to say thank you, everybody. These are the five ways, six ways that you can become a part of it. Donate land, a space, skills, gear, time. We're looking for land in the Malala area, if you by chance know any of it. Uh, become a volunteer. We're, we do lots of tabling events where we hand out our stuff and just educate people on what we're doing. Um, as well as our free skill series, we always need volunteers to help out put that on. You can, oh, whoops, four, whoops, typo. Uh, become a member, obviously. Uh, come to the free skill series or take a class. So thank you, everybody, and uh, I look forward to connecting more people to the ecosystems that we're all part of. Thank you.